never meant anything I said Just spitting it up everything I've been fed To keep it from eating away at me Never said anything I meant I never said the letters that I should have sent So it's asking too much for you all to believe Hello and welcome back. Welcome back. It's nice to see everyone. We have a great, great, great topic to delve into tonight and a place to go. And I'm very happy to say that at the end of our time together tonight, our 30 minutes, we'll have um, four very well-known guests um, who will give us an announcement. Yes, we have a great announcement to give tonight. Fantastic. I can't wait. Um, those, those of us who value honor will feel the shame of our ancestors. Yeah, this should, this should prove to be an outstanding, outstanding time. We're going to start off. We're going to start off with. Oh, excuse me. We're going to start off. I'm sorry, little direction problem. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. Chewy, I'll tell you when. Um, we're going to start off today, though, with our section on the cave of Amon. And we're going to take now the next step down in our descent into the Chthonian realm. Again, we're going to do it by bringing the future and the past together in the present. Fantastic. We'll begin with a look at um, Anastasia. And so I want to run a couple of, just a couple of clips, say a couple of things, and uh, hone kind of focus where we're looking here. Remember, we're searching for Lady Babylon. And under the right circumstances, everything can come together. So tonight I want to start off with a couple of clips that we've put together here from Neil's interview with Anastasia. And I want us to look at uh, just responses. I just want to see what are responses. As if we're just having tea, saying, what is this situation? And who is this person? Let's run the first one. I am like a volunteer, obviously, but I talk with soldiers quite a bit. And, you know, it's has not diminished. People are very hyped and still willing to do what is necessary to do. And uh, people always say, like, you know, we didn't choose the war, obviously, but it's here. So what else can you do other than, you know, defend what you love? And what we love is Ukraine, you know, <laughs> and our people. Uh, so yeah, like so people from the West say, like, oh, we should stop this war. We should go for peace agreements because we care about Ukrainian people. And yet, no, you don't, you know. <laughs> if you cared about Ukrainian people, you would listen to what Ukrainian people want. And what we want, by every estimation, by every poll ex in existence, is uh, to continue fighting, no matter what, and to return our uh, uh, people back home. And what so. Russians are doing to those people there is atrocious, and in ways I cannot even describe to you. Every liberated city has had mass graves, uh, tortures, rapes, slaughter of civilians on insane With scale. And this is the wait for us to liberate them. So this is not negotiable. We are not giving up those people to Russia and to this nothingness, basically, is what expects them if we give up on them. And so, so what we've got is um, some more of the shenanigans. And now the criminal courts have declared that, hey, look, uh, Vlad, Vlad Putin is taking children. Look at the irony. If you cannot taste the irony of this, Vlad is 
abducting children like a pirate. Yeah, and he's forcing them, putting them in camps, forcing them to speak Russian. No more Ukrainian. No more Ukrainian. You'll speak Russian. Right? L look at the irony here about those who support Putin. This is a strong woman. People talk about a strong woman in the States. This is a strong woman. She was involved in the 2014 revolution. And when I get a chance to interview her, I've been waiting, but apparently Kharkiv was hit by, gifted with, with uh, hypersonic missiles and drones and all sorts of things to keep them in the dark. So as soon as we can, I will get an interview for her. Um, she's agreed to do it. And I'm going to ask her. I'm going to ask her about the nitty gritty. Let her speak. Chewy, hit her again. And with the Western support we are having right now, we have every chance to win it. And we intend to. We intend to do that. And I hope we will. So continue, please do, if you can, to support maybe um, Ukrainian volunteers. I have a PayPal as well, by the way, <laughs> on my Twitter, which you can help out and see what I'm doing on Twitter. I post like pretty much everything I'm doing. And uh, yeah, so assist uh, organizations that help Ukraine, uh, such as uh, Come Back Alive, for example, which is a pretty good uh, fund to help Ukraine. Or maybe help like volunteers like me, for example, and people who are doing projects of helping our army in every way we can. And also talk with people about it. It's also very important so you know to to fight against some narratives that russia propaganda continues to spew and those who support russia in the west as well so do try to you know <laughs> to fight them back and to spread the word so, so bringing this message um, just how how difficult is it for us just to bring we have the technology now we can bring her message out, right? And we can show the world, right? We can be those people who put that statue of the Virgin on the hill and said, freedom, that's what it's about. That's what it's about. One more time. So they already did some moves like they did in 2014 to achieve that. And I do think they would be full on ready for all out invasion uh, into Georgia and Moldova. But then is we them up you know, <laughs> so they so they are stopped currently at Ukraine, which is, I guess, for us to be the shield sort of <laughs> to Georgia and to Moldova and protect countries from, well, you know, with our with our, I guess, bodies and lives, you could say, because um, they should not move anywhere further and uh, they should be stopped uh, for good this time around, I hope. Like, why are we not helping these people? Why are we not helping these people? Why are we you know, giving money to Ukraine if we could help this and help that? And you're just like, dudes, like, I, we are super appreciate the help, obviously, right? Without it, we would be But um, it's not because you give money to Ukraine that are homeless people in the United States, you know? They just point out various problems in the United States and they try to blame it on United States helping Ukraine uh, against this unjust invasion, which is uh, pretty strange because there's no connection to those things whatsoever. Yeah, fantastic, right? Listen to it from the source. I mean, that, isn't that what we need anyway? You don't need any commentary. You don't need to explain it. You just need to hear the voice. We're going to hear one more, and then we're going to jump into the cave. He's talking about is Holodomor, which is the famine I mentioned. Four million people plus died in that. So not only they were like uh, starved to death in Ukraine, but also they would take food, like Soviet soldiers, take it to Moscow, export it, continue to sell it, while people were just straight up dying of starvation. So five, five wheat loss is something that was on the books. So it's the, the fact that you can shoot a person in Ukraine, like in the head, for stealing food. So basically starving people would steal. Steal is not the word I would use, but you know, <laughs> would steal the food they themselves grow uh, to, you know, not starve and to feed their families. And they would be shot for that. So yeah, so this was a very much like, uh, you know, a genocide in every sense of the world. And uh, yeah, it's not only that, like I said, it's like mass deportation, oppression, executions. There was like red terror period, which was uh, uh, right after revolution, basically in October. 
So that was the period when Red Terror uh, was happening in Ukraine as well. So people were just killed, dragged down out of their houses, shot for not being willing to be part of Soviet Union, Russia. Yeah, and that's what's coming. They're standing in the breach there, and that's what's coming. So what is terribly ironic and yet beautiful at the same time is that the group that holds the signs that say, save the children, is the group that supports and pushes the, the um, Putin's desires, whether it's one of our former presidents or whether it is um, people in our government. This faction is there, right? So what do we need to do? What can we do but listen to those voices, but bring those voices here and say, what is she saying, right? Where is this dragon, right, who uh, breathes the fire? Yeah, where is this truth that we're looking for? I guarantee it's on the side of protecting the mothers and the daughters. I guarantee you. Yeah, now he's taking camps. He's making camps. Shame on us. Let me just say something to the Americans in the group. I know there's others from other countries, but to the Americans, man, it was our experiment, right? This was handed down to us. The people who created this freedom that you feel and breathe and live in, those people said, you have to stand you have to stand. And if it meant going off to a foreign country to, to help the cause, then that's what they did. That's what they did. Freedom. We need freedom. Not this tyrannical stuff is not, is not new. Is not new. So um, I hope to have uh, Anastasia um, in interview form and I'll bring those, I'll bring those into you in uh, short two minute clips like this, letting her give her own straight up answers. And there is a direct link, of course, to our cave. Yeah, our cave. Let's bring up the first of the cave tonight. We're gonna go to the Orphic Fragments. Here's that guy I've been blathering about for so long, Otto Kern. Thank you, Otto Kern, there's your name. Um, so here we go. Otto Kern's Orphic Fragments. Number two, please. Yes, here we go. I'm going to look at, this is from Diodorus Siculus. Diodorus Siculus, give us Diodorus's picture, please. This is, you know, just a made up representation for all we know. He looked nothing like this, right? But, um, here we, uh, here, here we have his work, right? Um, he's writing histories, first century, first century. He's writing in Greek. Wonderful. Wonderful stuff. He's trying to go back to the roots of the people that were migrating around. Remember, we talked about these migrations, these Bronze Age migrations. Tonight, we're going to go one step back to the prehistory, to the autochthonous people, the people called the Pulaskians. And you're going to be surprised to find out that the things that you got from certain places you didn't. This is before Christianity. This is before Judaism. Yeah, this is before any of the monotheistic theistic religions, before those things were kicking off. Well, they had some in Egypt too, right? But before those movements within the mysteries kicked off, we have these Pelasgians and we have these rites preserved within the language. And I'm going to take you back to some of the old language. We're going to go to the, to the virgin, right? We're seeking the virgin. Yeah, the maiden, right? Yeah, please. So in this fragment, what do we have here? Number four, this is from Diodorus. And he says, Ton de un linon fasi tois pelaski kois gramasi. That's the words I want you to hear. Pelaski kois gramasi. Yeah, they say that Linus um, composed this, the deeds of the, a work on the deeds of Dionysus, and that he did it in the Pelasgian letters. In the Pelasgian letters. Yeah, and he left it behind in his little, his little memoirs. Yeah, nice. 
Also Orpheus, Orpheus and Pronapides, yeah. Pronapiden don Homeron didaskalon. Yeah, Pronapides, the teacher of Homer. Oh, nice, nice. So here's Orpheus, and here they're, they're using the Pulaskian letters. And you say, wait a minute, Pulaskian, what? Remember, I've been asking you to solve the question of the dragon's tongue. Right? And people are working on it. Nice job, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Anya, love it. Love it, Fish. Love it. You're working on those things. And tonight we're going to have some little clues. Tonight we're not working with the Orphic letters. We're working with the Pulaskian letters. And the Pulaskian letters come before, come before everything. For everything, we're talking pre-Egyptian culture. We're talking pre-Indo-European. We're talking about the basis, the language, the human language spread out through the Mediterranean and from which we're deriving this right and this history. Yeah, let's go to the next one, please. I want to start here. Now, Linus, they say, composed an account in the Pelasgic letters of the deeds of the first Dionysus and of the other myth mythical legends and left them among his memoirs. And in the same manner, use was made of these Pelasgic letters by Orpheus and Pronopides, who was a teacher of Homer, great, and a gifted writer of songs. Right? Notice, I just want you to see, he mentions Laomedon. He talks about going to Nyssa, where the ancient natives of the city relate that Dionysus was reared there. Yeah, and that there's this thing called a Phrygian poem. Yeah, okay, next text, please. This is the expression Yeah, in the Pelasgian letters. Good, I want you to look at that, Pelasgian. Who are these people? Go down. This, then, is the account of Dionysius. Among the Greeks, Linus was the first to discover the different rhythms and song. And when Cadmus brought from Phoenicia the letters, as they are called, Linus was again the first to transfer them into the Greek language to give a name to each character and to fix its shape. Now, the letters as a group are called Phoenician because they were brought to the Greeks from the Phoenicians, but as single letters... The Pulaskians were the first to make use of the transferred characters. So they were called Pulaskic. Okay, you see what I'm saying? So this is an old, 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 not this guy. Get him off there. We'll bring him back in a second. This is an, that's a Limnian uh, steel. Anyway, um, this Pulaskian language that predates, there's, there's, Questions, who are these Pelasgians and what are they doing there? These, these autochthonous people spread throughout from Asia Minor into Greece, right? So here's the sites, nice map there. Look at, they're on the island of Lemnos up there. Yep, off the coast of Thrace, right? Samothrace, see Samothrace there? Take it down. If you were sitting there on the beach in, in Thrace, you can look and you can see Samothrace there. Nice island. Beyond that, Right beyond that, where it's no longer visible, is that Limnian. And we have a Limnian stele, and it has on it the um, characters that they were debating about. This is Limnian. We're going to call it Limnian. But long story short, it turns out it's Pelasgian. And logically, it looks a lot like Etruscan. Yeah, it looks like the Pelasgians and the, and the Etruscans are the same people. Those of you who are, are learning dragon tongue, the Orphic letters can use this to help you decipher them. Okay, and um, let me just pull that up again. By the way, this is in Boustrophodon, right? So for those of you who are saying, uh, wow, tell me, does it go right, left, left, right? Yes, the answer is yes, it goes both. <laughs> it's like a snake more than a more than a cow walking around, but okay, whatever. They didn't call it Ophistrophodon. <laughs> yeah, 
it's a word for snake. Okay, next. Next slide, please. How did the Phoenician letters appear on the Greek mainland? The palace of Cadmus, if Cadmus is an historical figure, has been discovered in Thebes and may be roughly dated around 14 to 1200 BC. And letters were found in it, but they were not of Semitic origin. Take it down. That's in the journal, American Journal of Philology, right? Now we're getting philologists. I'm going to quote a few philologists here tonight because this is the stuff that turns them on. This is all you do with it. You're trying to figure out where these languages come from. That's why anybody who forbids you from speaking a language, that's a bad, bad dude. Bad dude. Yeah, needs to be stopped. Yeah. Um, so we're talking early on, 1600, right? Next slide, please. Thank you, Chewy. Now, Linus, they say, compose an account in plastic letters of the deeds of Dionysus and the other mythical legends and left them among his memoirs in the same manner. Whoops, we've had this. But please go on. Please go on. Yes. Um, here we go. I want you to see here further. Further in there is a cave. Let's just go to the cave. We're, we're walking around. I'm sorry, that was a little herky-jerky, but we're walking around with um, the Pulaskians and their religion, and we're going to their religious sites, and we're going to look at their gods. Um, all the oomph, 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 that sound is a Pulaskian sound. Isn't that nice? You see it in things like Corinth. <laughs> so there are Pulaskian roots all over the place in the Greek world, in the Greek world. And they're, they talk about the Pulaskians are all over the sources. You can go look them up, right? Um, uh, and you won't, you'll find them in the historians, you'll find them in the playwrights. Uh, from Sophocles, there's, we have some great information from, from Sophocles, believe it or not. Yeah, isn't that cool? Um, anyway, it looks like they were, they were considered to be the ancestors, right? They're considered to be the um, Greek. Sometimes they're described as Greek. Yeah, and they're ending up in a lot of old, old, old Greek religion coming out we're going to look at one that shocks you tonight from the from the septuagint believe it or not it's buried in the septuagint isn't that cool all right um bring up that next one here we go further in there is a cave circular in shape of marvelous size and beauty just get the cult context going in your head for above and all about it rises a crag of immense height formed of rocks of different colors for the rocks lie in bands and send forth a bright gleam some like that purple, which comes from the sea, for the entrance grow marvelous trees, some fruit bearing, others evergreen, and all of them fashioned by nature for no other end than to delight the eye. Take it off and to open it. Yeah, to open it. Coming from the side was the expression. Yes, yes. Okay, next. Same slide, good. Now to this cave, the account runs, Amon came and brought the child. Who's that child? That is Dionysus. You mean Dionysus is a child of Amon? Yes, he is. And gave him into the care of Nyssa, one of the daughters of Aristeus. And he appointed Aristeus to be the guardian of the child. He being a man who excelled in understanding and self-control and all learning. The duty of protecting the boy against the plottings of his stepmother, Rhea, he assigned to Athena who a short while before had been born of the earth and had been found beside the river Triton. Good, good. That's why we call her Tritonian. Nice. Um, we need to find a location and a place for this. We need to zoom in with the language. We need just to let the language carry us to that place. We're keeping our hand on the rope in the cave as we go through it, as we go through it. Good. Next text. Yeah, I'm not going to read all this. I just want you to see um, when the valor and fame of Dionysus became spread abroad, Rhea, angered at Amun, strongly desired to get her Dionys Dionysus into her power. Okay, I want you to realize there is a struggle going on and that you see the word Crete, right? As for Cronus, the myth relates after his victory, he ruled harshly over these regions, which had formerly been Amun's. Okay, take it off. Yes, the father of the first Dionysus. 
the father of the first Dionysus is usurped by the Saturn. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that should put you in some context. Take out your, everybody pull out your augers now. <laughs> right. Right. You know where we are. Sun, moon, and stars. Okay. Hit it with the next. Please. We're running from time tonight. Go ahead. Yes, since the Libyans had said to Dionysus before the battle that as the time when Ammon had been driven from the kingdom, he had prophesied, that's what I want you to see. Ammon is the prophetic God. There is a reason that that cult is spread throughout the Mediterranean and always has that oracular um, current to it. Always has that oracular current to it. The Dodonian prophecy that is so important to the Greeks, right? Everybody goes to Dodona, right? That's just the way it is. It's one of the big, big oracles. And um, that's Pulaskian. <laughs> yes, yes. So you see the operation. People say, did this come from Egypt? Did this come from, what about this settlement? What about the Phoenicians? There were no Phoenicians around. They only called themselves Phoenicians because of what the Pulaskians were doing. And the name Pulaskian, as a classical philologist, looks like it comes from the word for purple, the purple dye. Yes, yes, the purple dye. Do we have that? Bring, bring us up. Yeah, Pelagium, right, right? Relating to the sea, right? Pelagios in the Greek. We're following the Romans here, right? Sea mussels. Go back to that, please. Sea mussels. Look at that. Sea mussels. Follow the way down the pages to Roman numeral number two. And look at B, Pelagium, the purple color. Our Pelasgians are originally of the purple. The Phoenicians who take their gramata, who transmit that gramata, to the Greeks, are calling themselves the purple people. Yeah, the purple people. We're talking prehistory, right? Prehistory is where this is coming from. So don't try to tell me how it is that some antinomian got involved because he doesn't exist for thousands of years. Yeah. Your Christianity and your Judaism, they've just been non-existent. They don't exist. But the oracular Saturnian religion that they are promoting, this chance to have ionic life, this thing is very real and very much out of this old prehistoric people. Please, next slide. Wonderful. Egyptians. I see you're Egyptian and I raise you Pelasgian. Pelasgos. Yeah. Look at the, under A, just look at the first word in Greek, dodonen. Yeah. Dodonen Pelasgon Hedranon. Oh, the seat of Pelasgian Dodona. Look on the second line down. I told you Dodona was big, right? That's Hesiod, by the way. Look at Tursenoi. And right away, you say, wait a minute. The Pelasgians were the Tursenoi? Yes. Yes. Wait, I know the, the Tursinians, also called by the Greeks the Tyrrhenians, that they were those people that the Romans, with their Venus's tongue, called the Etruscans. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. So um, if you look at Etruscan, you're going to find out it looks just like the old Pelasgian, right? Which scholars and classical philologists will have sat around for decades, a century, de debating, two centuries, debating what the origins of these words are. Some people say, oh, it uh, looks like it's related to Thracian and trying to trace it, right, where it comes from originally. 
Yeah, and it always goes back through the river of the Mycenaean Greek, right? It's one of the places that it just made its made its currents. Now, give us another. Mm. Yeah, and Circe. So coming to the Etruscans brings us to Italy, and it brings us to Circe. And Circe, the daughter of Helios, Hyperion's son, loved steadfast Odysseus and bore Agrius and Latinus. Oh, wait a minute, what? Latinus? That has the word Latin in it. Who was faultless and strong. Oh, good for him. Also, she brought forth Telogonus by the will of Golden Aphrodite. Why Golden Aphrodite? That's a cult title. That's the Aphrodite who's involved in the production, right? And they ruled over the famous Tyrsinians. Nice. Next, next. You see, the cult is really the cult is really what's pushing and driving everything. And this is the area. You see the, the Libyans in the south. We have Carthage there. We have Sicily, where Diodorus happens to be from. And the Tyrrhenian power here. This is this is a Pelasgian power. This is an early power in the cult. Go ahead. Oh, it's gorgeous. Next, please. What are these people? They are autochthon. They are of the chthon. You don't call their Zeus a Zeus. You call him a chthonian Zeus. Yeah, a chthonian Zeus. Yeah, nice. That kth, kth, Guess what? <laughs> yeah, guess what? It's so beautiful. The language so, it's just like amber. It just traps that precious bit of the past and just kind of keeps it preserved for all time. Can you never take this stuff away? Uh, next, please. Yeah, Pulaskian and Aryan Medea. So let's just look. Next slide. The first Dionysus was the son of Amun. Yeah. And look at this little tidbit, right? Um, some Georgian scholars, including these Georgian scholars, connect the Pelasgians with the Ibero-Caucasian peoples of the prehistoric Caucasus, known to the Greeks as Colchians. Right? We're going right back to the garden. We're going right back to Edom, where those four rivers meet. And you're saying, wait a minute. I'm doing this, but I'm doing it in a way that comes through the late Bronze Age. But I know that this is actually um, 3,000 years previously. Yeah, three to 5,000. Oh, my goodness. Yes, that's where we are. We're seeing the focus come through that medwa. Yeah, please. <clears throat> to blow it right, to bring the end of our search to its culmination, right? Here we are in the cave, and we've been looking for that source, for that origin. You thought, you thought that Adam was a Hebrew name. It is not. It is not. Neither is Eve. <laughs> and you say, how can you say that? How can you say that it, it's contrary to the last 2,000 years of hoo-ha? Yes, it is. But it's a fact. Let me show you. Chewy, hit him with a chart. This is going to blow your mind. Look at this. Look at the linear B. We have the Latin. Oh, that's nice. And then we have Greek. Isn't this gorgeous? Who is this guy? Who is the Adam We? Right. Who is the Adam Mewes? Who is that? Adam. So when the Sibylline oracles stand up and they tell you that Adam is Greek and it was based upon a religious practice, each of the characters in his name represent the action of quartering. Of quartering. If you know Adam, you can quarter. Right. It's north, south, east, and west. And it goes back through the Bronze Age, through, it's captured in the Mycenaean Linear B, which is where these people are. It's why Amun is in Crete. Yeah. 
That's why almond is in Crete. Gorgeous, 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 gorgeous. Nothing is the way that you thought. Welcome to Almond's Cave. Nothing is the way you thought. I'm offering you some of the most beautiful distilled reality that you can possibly make. And it drips from the ceiling of this cave of the Pulaskians, the place where that virgin becomes the oracle. That's why we're stealing everybody. Yeah. Pirates, man. Pirates get dragged into this, right? Oh my God. It's gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. So, um, as we're trying to look at Dragon Tongue, we're trying to see how to decipher it. We need to get serious about its roots, and we need to see the connection between the Orphic letters, the Pulaskian letters, and the performance of the mystery. Dionysus is the son of Bacchus, uh, is the son of Amun, right? Bacchus is the son of Amun. Yeah. Yeah, that oracle was a Bacchic establishment. Kurene is not a native Greek word. Yeah, it turns out it's Pulaskian. So where do we go with the origins of Christianity, which started with a man getting arrested in a public park with a naked boy at 4 a.m.? with stuff on his face, screaming about being thirsty, and no, I'm not a child trafficker. How do we get to that point? It's through this pathway, through this pathway. And how are we going to find this place again? Where these, This is our history, right? There's nobody here that doesn't share this history. This is human history. Yeah, and... Um, we need to find it. We need to find it. We've got people coming on. Do we have do we have people in the gallery tonight? Yes, we do. We've got Rob. I want to say a few words before we start in. I see Thonius and I see Snappy. And I'm waiting for where where is is the Gnostic informant? We're waiting for Gnostic informant because he's gonna announce something tonight. He's gonna announce something. So we'll we'll maybe give him a minute to pop in. Come on. Come on, Neil. If you're not going to make your announcement, I'm going to make your announcement for you. Okay? <laughs> but that's no, that looks that's I don't want to do that. All right, let's start off with a, just a response to the material that we're talking about with the Pulaskians. Rob, you've got first shot. What do you think about Pulaskians and Dionysus? My favorite part was uh, in Egypt. I, I, I read you a Pulaskian. I really like that. I'm going to have to learn how to say Pulaskian correctly and i'm going to use that one <clears throat> that was an, uh, an excellent presentation again that um i'm gonna to have to catch up on uh, you, you're on fire you know, you know you're on fire at the minute and you, you're hitting as hard with information because you know now there's there's some there's some way for it to go a beautiful info on the orphic for classmates i'm sure they'll appreciate that um I'll, i kind of like uh, the aristeus part because if I'm right, if I remember rightly, is the son of Apollo and the father of Acteon, if I remember rightly. And that, that means just little bits to me. But for this to go all the way back to its roots in the, in the language and to see that in the linear B is phenomenal and mind-blowing and rather conclusive in my opinion. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, snappy. Your response? I'm, I was really blown away by your lecture. So the Pelasgians are something I've been interested in a while. So uh, a philosopher I love is this guy here, Ludwig Klages. He wrote a book that I'm reading called Cosmogonic Eros. And he uses the Pelasgians as an example of sort of primordial culture and like returning to like a... a an original base for the Bronze Age. And then he connects that with the Bronze Age mystery rites in India and in other places. And I just wanted, like, there's just so much cool stuff he talks about here about how the, cent the center part of, of the Pelasgian society was almost 
taking care of the dead and the rights for the dead. They'd be buried under the stoves and the houses and right in the center of the home. And everything was centered around these cycles of death and rebirth. And they would wrap them in purple cloth. It's uh, really powerful stuff. So we're getting somewhere really interesting. <laughs> Fantastic, fantastic, and snap and uh, Thonius, Thonius, give me your take on tonight. I uh, thought it was amazing the the Pelasgians being the root of the purple and, and finding the origin of the language, the, the the linear B from what I take it. I think it's amazing, and uh, I think that they might hold the key to all the ingredients. And how you said that, Amen is the father of Dionysus blew my mind. And you said that Kronos usurped Dionysus' first father. And it makes me wonder if Amun was Oronos. The only Amun that I've, I've read about is in the Hermetica. And, and I, I just, you blew my mind tonight. Fantastic. You have to, you have to love, uh, you have to love the fact that years later, People will come along and take little bits of that and preserve it and protect it and pass it on like Abamon. Yeah, and <laughs> and um, just, uh, let me let me just ask Thonius, you were you brought in? Oh, some psychoanalyst. I think his name was Jung. Jung, you've been looking at some Jung. Does any of this stuff? Um, have to do with Jung at all? What you've been seeing? Well, uh, from what I've what I've been reading about Jung is that he, from what I understand in the Red Book, it it's like he is trying to mimic what Zeus did. He's trying to go into the abyss and talk to Nix and to know all things. And and it it's it's it, it's kind of it's kind of onto that. I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. No, that's exactly that's exactly what I meant, right? He's putting it into don't you don't you think he's practicing the mystery? I mean, he's he's even getting responses of, about the future, and from other people who are telling him, who are bringing him elements of the future that are are shocking him. Yeah, it's the operation of the, of the mystery. Uh, love it, Snappy. I mean, love it, Thelonious, that you're doing. He, that. Even the, he even said that he got the scepter. He went down there and he pulled out the scepter from going into the abyss and talking to the oracle, basically, of night. Just like Zeus did in the Diverni Papyrus. He tried to yeah, do well, Yeah, and the, now the question is, was he doing that because he was drawing on that reality, right? Or was he doing it because he was reading it and recreating it? Well, we know with the, with the boy that he was talking to at the, the young man that he was talking to at the, um, um, who was inside the you know um, place where they kept people that they didn't want running around um, <laughs> for whatever reason? He was talking about the future, right? He had never seen the this. He didn't know about the release of this material. He didn't know about um, what it meant within ancient religion. Yet it found him within a person, right? Right, but gorgeous. Love, love it, Thonius. Snappy, do we have any? Do, do you have any impression of the more easterly uh, working of the Pelasgians through Colchis and through? You know, is there? Are we getting over? Do you want? Do you smell India? Any in any of this? Whoops! I think you're muted. Oh, definitely. So when I when we're looking at uh, Mycenaean culture, you can compare a lot of this to what's happening in uh, Harappa in the Indus Valley. And there's a lot of key things. Like we're seeing the presence of the bulls. We're seeing the um, the bull wrestling motif. We're seeing these same horns and these horn figures. And then we're also seeing predominantly is that mother goddess figure with the snakes. You know. And then we know that they're both cultures are using cannabis are using the mushroom, and they're engaged in this purple trade because we have traces of the purple in Harappa, but they're not producing it. So they're getting it from somewhere, right? And then so there's also these seals that look a lot similar. So there may be even a connection between uh, the Harappan language and what's going on with the uh, the Mycenaean. 
Gorgeous, gorgeous. And you know, all, there's so much of a frontier there for people to figure out, put it, it's like a puzzle to figure out where the influences are coming from, how the languages are being pressed on the civilizations. And you mentioned the, the snake goddess, right? Why is the snake goddess so prevalent, right? I mean, it seems like a strange thing, but there you go. You have it, right? And it's gorgeous. It's at the very center of the cult, the use of these venoms. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's amazing. We'll end up with Rob. Rob, you have the last word. You have the last word. I think, I think uh, somebody's mic is on, if you guys can mute. Rob, you have the last word. You have the last word. I want you to say something, please, about okay. Anastasia. Anastasia. About Anastasia. Very educated, as far as I could tell. I was uh, very impressed with um, with her abilities to um, watch the messages as they came in, as well as engage in a quite a, a, a deep, engaging conversation. And for do that, take some. She she could answer every question with eloquence, and got quite a, a great deal about it. I just won't go to the snake goddess though, because I discovered something that I found profound. That you know the snake goddess, and she's holding the two snakes. That's that's the image we all see. Well, I found is I found out is that's the votive. That's the votive to the snake goddess. The snake goddess doesn't doesn't. She's she's. The snake goddess, of course, she's in, what's it? But she isn't holding two snakes, and I found that very curious. And then I'm going to go to father. So you're the father of Dionysus, are you? And if Gnostic informant was here, he'd be all over you because he thinks you're responsible. Your your name and you're responsible for quite a lot, aren't you? Through through history. So I'll leave you with them three comments. All right, you guys heard it here. Thank you for coming. And hope uh, next week we're going to bust into, we're going to have our fight club week, right? So every season we'll have one fight club. So I'm ha uh, there's seven seasons. People have been asking, is there, a, is there a beginning and an end to this? Yes, there is, <laughs> right? It's, believe it or not, it's a narrative, right? It's a song. So there is. And tonight, uh, next week we want to next Friday we want to have the fight club so I'm encouraging everybody who wants to step up to say to send a message to say I am a child of Heracles and I am unafraid um, of your uh, Tennessee law <laughs> yes okay uh, thank you guys for coming tonight hail Satan hail Satan hail Satan thank you Questions that that fella might ask.